Welcome to the Religion and Politics 08 discussion series from the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life. I'm John Green, Senior Fellow on Religion and American Politics at the Forum. Today we'll be discussing outreach to religious voters in the 2008 presidential campaign. In this election cycle, both Democrats and Republicans are talking a lot about faith, in many cases their own faith. A good example is Mitt Romney's long-anticipated speech on faith in America. Another example is Hillary Clinton's participation in the Compassion Forum when she described feeling the presence of God throughout her life. However, faith has been controversial as well. The relationship between Barack Obama and Reverend Jeremiah Wright and the endorsement of John McCain by Reverend John Hagee come to mind. Despite the potential pitfalls, the presidential campaigns have made outreach to religious voters a priority. How have the campaigns faced the challenges posed by faith and values? What are the keys to successful appeals to people of faith? And what role is religion likely to play in the general election? To explore these questions, we have two distinguished guests. Bern Strider is former senior advisor and director of faith outreach for Hillary Clinton and her presidential campaign. He recently co-founded the Eliezer Group, which is a faith and values consulting firm that connects nonprofits, businesses, progressive and democratic candidates with the nation's faith community. Mark DeMoss served as an advisor on faith and values issues to former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney and his presidential campaign. He is the founder of the DeMoss Group, a public relations firm that works with Christian organizations and leaders. Gentlemen, welcome both of you, and it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks. Thanks. Glad to be here. I'd like to begin by talking about the role of religious voters in the strategies of the primary campaigns that you've worked on. And Mark, let's begin with you. What challenges did the Romney campaign face with regard to religious voters? Really three, I think. One is obviously he was a Mormon, is a Mormon, and uh, secondly, uh, he was uh, little known nationally. Um, he, he really hadn't been a national figure as a, a governor of Massachusetts. And then third, I would suggest um, uh, something I didn't think would be a problem uh, earlier um, in, in the primaries because he, he didn't seem particularly viable, but uh, later became uh, more of an issue on this front, and that is uh, the, the presence of a Southern Baptist evangelical candidate in uh, Mike Huckabee. I think those were the, the challenges that Mitt Romney faced. How did the campaign uh, attempt to deal with those challenges early and late? Well, I think, um, and, and I've, I've said all along really, I think that it's more important, I, I'm more interested that a, that a candidate share my values than that he or she shares my f faith or religion particularly. And I think um, on that respect, Mitt Romney scores quite well. Um, interestingly, it was to me at least, that conservative, uh, re religious conservatives and evangelicals had for ye decades really worked hand in hand with, with Mormons, with, with Jews, with conservative Catholics, and, and a host of, um, <coughs> of people of faith on issues in which they had common ground and common values, life issues and, and many other issues. And um, so it was interesting to me that somebody, uh, a Mormon that we might have worked with in the trenches, um, fighting pornography or, or uh, d defending um, unborn life, um, suddenly uh, the, the rules seemed to change for some people when, when a Mormon wanted to put himself forward for president. But I think um, in Mitt Romney's case, um, he dealt with this the way he dealt with the whole campaign, which was to just put himself forward. And he, he is what he is, uh, his family is what they are, and um, I think he made tremendous strides in a relatively short period of time, coming from, not from nowhere, but from, um, certainly not from a national stage. Burns, what about the Hillary Clinton campaign? I imagine that you all faced some challenges with uh, religious voters as well. Sure. Thanks for having us here. This is good. The P Forum does good work, and it's very helpful out in the field where all of us are out working and doing our stuff out there. You know, with Senator Clinton, one of one of the challenges is a little opposite. She's very well known, and or at least there's perception of her out in the nation's faith community. And um, as many of us know, over the past 
you know, 15, 20 years, polling has always indicated a pretty low number of people who would say that Hillary Clinton is a woman of faith, person of faith. And um, so you come in with that challenge 16 months ago when this began. And so what, what I had, what I had to work with was kind of this, this gulf between what was a reality and what was a perception. Because in the reality you had this really active United Methodist who, um, you know, it's been her life active in the church, you know, everything I, uh, I always like to point out from church picnics on the governor's mansion lawn in Little Rock to, to leading Sunday school to, to all kind of stuff, very active, very heartfelt, but the perceptions. It's a big challenge, how do you do that and what do you do? And um, so, you know, that was basically the, 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 the paradigm, the challenge I took up and, and went forward with. and spent my time, you know, understanding where to build those bridges, how to build them, how to help her connect, because it's not a matter of, of changing or moving or redirecting someone's authenticity. You know, the authenticity is set in stone, whatever it is. Um, you know, so that's what you're going to share. And so it was a matter of just delivering, you know, of laying out a strategy to deliver who she is to the American voters, in this case the Democratic primary voters, and um, we spend a lot of time on the grassroots level. We enjoy and love and appreciate the, um, the leaders in the clergy and faith community, and we know them, and um, um, carried on a relationship, but we spend all of our time literally in the grassroots, working down in um, you know, churches and faith communities in the smallest of small towns out in the country, be it West Virginia, or Ohio, Texas, wherever. And um, um, so we kind of, the, the idea was to put ourselves in the middle of the tightrope and work from both ends to grow the grassroots up and to grow and maintain our relationships with the with the leaders of the faith community. You both have alluded in one way or another to the role of the candidate. How, how important is the, the candidate and his or her own religiosity in reaching out to religious voters, Mark? Uh, well, the candidate is all important because that's, uh, th that's what this is all about. And so uh, I think staffs and strategies and consultants can't make a candidate something they're actually not. Um, and I certainly wouldn't wouldn't try if 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 offered the opportunity if that's what somebody wanted wanted me to do. But I think uh, you know in Mitt Romney's case, um, uh, I, I think the, it, the important thing was not not to reach out on on religious terms, but to reach out on on uh, values terms. And uh, you know I've I've often said that as a uh, evangelical Southern Baptist. In terms of values, I have more in common with most Mormons than I would with a liberal Southern Baptist or a liberal Methodist or Episcopalian or you name it. And um, uh, I remember uh, the governor telling me one day that uh, he said, look, there are Mormons who wouldn't vote for me. And likewise, there are Southern Baptists that I wouldn't vote for or haven't voted for. And, um, um, and so I think for us, this really was about values. Do I have common values with this man, Mitt Romney? Um, and um, uh, regardless of whether we, sh you know, worship the same way on Sunday. And um, again, I, I think we made uh, good progress. But the candidate, the candidate's the product. He's he or she is is what yeah. what we're about. And um, and and it, and I wouldn't work for for any candidate. You know, Mark, you mentioned that the challenge that Governor Romney faced having Mike Huckabee in the race, a former Southern Baptist minister. Burns, it seems to me that Senator Clinton faced a similar problem with Senator Obama, someone who speaks very comfortably about his faith. Yeah. How did that impact what you all did? Well, that's a good question. It's, it's an interesting one. I've never quite seen it that way. I actually saw it from our perspective. Democratic Party um, reconnecting you know, coming from a different direction than Republicans, you know, 
uh, making up ground, so to speak, in our conversation with the nation's faith community, I saw it as a good thing, a real blessing, that all three of the leading Democratic candidates, Senator Clinton, Senator Obama, and Senator Edwards, were being active, vocal, and honest about their faith. I thought it was good for the whole primary process, good for the party, and ultimately it's going to be good in November, I, I, I believe. So I, I thought it was a good thing. Now, with that said, Senator Obama is extremely articulate. He's got a, a, a strong testimony, and he gives it well. And, um, you know, you don't compete with that. You find <laughs> things you do well and go do them. It's like um, playing checkers with my six-year-old the other day, and he kept he was extremely focused in the bottom right hand corner where he had no chips and finally I said I said you can't do anything now you can't do anything about that get up here in the left of the upper left hand corner where your where your chips are and play ball you know and um, so you know you focus on your strengths and and move forward that way um, so but I, I thought it was a profoundly um, part of the historic nature of the Democratic primary and part of what was good about this primary was that all three were very vocal and active in, in sharing who they were, the whole person of them, you know, including their, their faith. But, you know, Bert, go ahead. I, I want to say this too. I, I think uh, uh, w I agree with those who say, look, faith, faith uh, your, your faith is important and it defines you, but I don't think faith uh, should be a calling card in in political races. Uh, for example, um, uh, Governor Huckabee ran an ad in um, South Carolina before the primary there that identified him as a Christian leader and he said, my faith defines me, it's who I am, and so on. And and I agree with that as, as a Christian. He didn't run that ad in Michigan. He didn't run that ad in Florida. And if your faith defines you, it defines you in all 50 states or it doesn't define you at all in my view. And, and that's what I'm troubled by, this, that, that, that faith becomes a, uh, a political football or a calling card and, and whose faith is better. And, and I, I really think, um, uh, you know, what, a lot of us are going to be troubled if, if the day would ever occur in this country, and I suppose it could, where uh, let's say where neither candidate of its party uh, really professed faith. What, what would a, a lot of religious, uh, certainly religious conservatives, would have would be in a real quandary there. And, and that's why I've, I sort of preach the importance of common values, not necessarily common faith. Would I like the president to share my faith? Sure. Uh, would, would I like uh, Mitt Romney's credentials? and intellect and character and competence and experience um, combined with a evangelical Southern Baptist faith, I'd love it. But I didn't have it. But I, so I liked everything else. And, and I, that, that's really why, uh, but, but there's still a lot of folks saying in this country, um, you know, I vote on this. And, uh, you know, I, I, I heard repeatedly uh, from people who said, how can you support a Mormon when we have one of our own running for president? We should support one of our own, a fellow Southern Baptist. Well, um, I think there's some other things that ought to be in, uh, part of a president, like competence and experience and so on. So it's, it's, these are interesting times. Let's just turn a little bit to the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. Burns, maybe you could help us a little bit. How do you how do you reach out to people of faith these days and, and, and get your message before them? Well, you know, I, I come at it relationally. There's different ways. And I, I, you know, you have to literally start by picking up the phone or hopping on a plane and going and seeing somebody sitting down and talking to them. Um, you know, the last few years has seen a... a um, you know, a shifting, changing dynamic out in the faith community around the country. There's some um, younger leaders out there. There, um, um, there are more leaders. Um, people in the pews have um, have 
asked to have a bigger conversation or to take all of their values and discuss them, not just two or three. Um, so you see a growth in discussions and activity around creation care and and um, poverty and these issues. And that's been helpful to my work and to democratic work because as that conversation has grown, at the same time our desire to have a conversation has grown as well and the meetings have been good. Um, I've been all over this country for 16 months meeting daily in small groups and large groups and when you sit down and say to a group of clergy that we're here, from my side of the table maybe we hadn't been here a lot but we're here now, we want a relationship, we want a conversation, can we talk a little while about the, a little while about those things that maybe we agree about and see how we can work together. Um, nine times out of ten, I believe more than nine times out of ten, um, you could have an entire meeting with a group of evangelicals or Catholics or anyone, any group of clergy and um, hot button issues not come up. That they really are inclined and motivated, you know, to find ways to work together to move the ball forward on various issues. So, so we just started, you know, we just started moving around the country and, and talking. I mean, beyond that, you do the things campaigns do, database building, um, modeling, projecting, targeting, um, but it still comes down to yourself, your candidate, your validators out on the road moving around in these states and um, and as people joke because I say it all the time just connecting dots connecting people to people and having a conversation and creating a relationship the very best which is extremely important what Democrats can do is take the edge off by creating a relationship and when it gets down to time to have a debate the debate can be a lot more honest because you know each other and there's a different level of respect and you can focus in on these issues that, that really matter in families lives. Well Mark how did the Romney campaign go about getting the message before the voters you well, wanted to present? Yeah, t tactically there are there are small steps and there are giant steps and you need them all uh, mm -hmm. so they did I think what most campaigns would do too with various committees and uh, sort of uh, group specific committees faith committees and so on um, we did a uh, we did a small meeting very early on before he had actually declared uh, in in October of uh, 06 at the governor's home in Massachusetts where I had invited uh, about 15 evangelical leaders uh, f to meet him and uh, for three hours we sat in their den and had a discussion with the governor and his wife um, and then there were some bigger things that 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 uh, had some effect, I think. And uh, writing is an important thing. Uh, having people writing on your behalf, mm -hmm. I wrote uh, I wrote a memo, a long memo, it was about five pages, that I mailed to uh, 150 uh, religious leaders, and it uh, found its way to the uh, New York Times, which did a story on it, and then it became a, a you know a subject of quite a bit of discussion and debate that was really making a case for how evangelicals could support a Mormon in this particular case and so that helped and you other people are writing things and um, in our case we really had to do two things that uh, we had to do something that most campaigns don't have to do on this subject we I think before we could sign up uh, uh, religious uh, voters to endorse or support this candidate we had to take some steps to uh, neutralize um, uh, certain religious uh, voters and leaders who would have naturally been inclined to renounce this candidacy, to say we can't in good faith uh, endorse a Mormon. And um, on that front, I think, um, I think we had great success in, in neutralizing, which for us was, was success. If we could neutralize folks who left to their own devices probably would have come out early and said uh, I don't know who I'm for but I can't support a Mormon um, there was not a single to my knowledge a single 
uh, reputable evangelical leader that ever said publicly uh, we should not support a Mormon. And so that was a, I think that was pretty good progress. The, um, you know, we talked earlier at the beginning about some of the controversies that come along with faith. You know, religion and religious values mm -hmm. can be very powerful in campaigns, but they can also be very powerful in the opposite Thank direction. Burns, how does a candidate deal with religious controversies that come up? Very carefully. <laughs> you, um, you know, again, as we were talking earlier, you know, this is foundational work. It's the bottom of the pyramid. It's who you are. It's your values. I agree with the discussion on faith and values. I didn't jump in a minute ago, but I understand what you're saying and the, the power of that, the importance of that authenticity. Um, but, you know, it's about, you know, if you set up the, the facts as they are, if you set up the authenticity, the narrative, back home we say testimony, if you set up the testimony that's honest and real and you share it, you know, you're certainly going to have those out there that um, have personal opinions all the way around because it's a personal issue. And, um, you know, if something um, grows to the level of a controversy, you know, you, you have to understand, you have to be ready to stand by your guns. You've got to know. It's a very good um, commentary there about, about shutting down things before they happen. You know, you want to know the talkers. You want to have validators ready to move instantly, clergy around the country. Um, you want to have those cell numbers of key talkers that are going to be talking about this and immediately start making sure the facts are where they need to be and people are out there talking. It's, it's, it can be tough. It can be harrowing. Um, we certainly saw and experienced things this time. Um, and you, gotta, you have to know what you're doing. I mean, you certainly don't want to create controversy by, um, you know, if it's um, Senator McCain and Pastor Hagee and, and that type of stuff going on, you know, it's, um, um, and maybe I can get some enlightenment here, but, you know, on our side of the aisle, we're like, how did the, the marksmen become the folks who couldn't shoot straight? You know, how did that happen? And, because, um, uh, you know, it was a very obvious misstep from the beginning and it remained a misstep to the end and you just about you know in some ways you made the same people mad twice you know in the way it, the way it carried out um, so that, that that was interesting I thought so you know a big part of this is is knowing this community and being ready to do it well and do it right and um, that shuts down a lot of controversy right <laughs> there Mark yeah you, you have to deal with controversy uh, carefully uh, honestly and quickly mm. and repeatedly uh, in some cases and uh, there, there's, there's no substitute for honesty. In, in this day and age particularly, no one has the luxury of being cute or clever mm. even for a minute. When you send people out to answer something or uh, spin it as we say in this business unfortunately, mm. you can't get away with that today. There are too many people watching and there are too many people pulling up tape and mm -hmm. and so I don't even understand the the people and the and the consultants and the staffers who even try to be clever because you can't pull it off oh. today well let's look forward to the to the fall campaign mark what what role do you see religion playing in the McCain campaign and and frankly in the in the whole uh, general campaign going towards November it, it I think it'll play a, a big role um, and I don't know if it's bigger than it should be necessarily. Uh, I still, you know, I'd like to see the day when, when religion didn't play a role. Uh, I think religious voters uh, have a role to play, but um, I, I'd like to really change the, uh, one of my missions I think is to change, change the debate from religion to values, religion to values. Values should play a huge role in a campaign. Religion, I think, should play a secondary role. And that's to, to some of my friends and colleagues is probably a little heretical. But um, uh, I, I really believe it. Um, after all, we really don't know as voters a very great deal about most or any of these candidates or past presidents 
personal faith anyway. Uh, we know what they tell us, but we don't know. And, and, and a lot of times, uh, uh, particularly religious conservatives, have put great stock in a candidate who they thought was, was a fellow evangelical, only to find out, gee, maybe they weren't, were disappointed. Well, if, you, if, if your uh, interest had been in common values rather than common theology, uh, you might have been less disappointed. Could be. Uh, Burns, what, what do you see happening in the fall campaign? Well, you know, you've got a really robust and pretty smart, very smart operation coming out of the Obama shop right now. Their focus on not just evangelicals, but zeroing in on young evangelicals. And we see out there, and I believe on your web page, that, um, you know, Senator McCain's not necessarily performing to the level past Republicans have at this point in the game with evangelicals. Senator Obama hasn't necessarily picked all of those up yet, but he's at a position to, to do that. Uh, it's in the middle, in that swing area. And, um, you know, you come down to, to cycles like the past two, um, you pick up two or three voters in each precinct in Ohio, and it's a <laughs> done deal. Um, so I think they're smart in how they're targeting because probably out of your own numbers, if you were to cross-tab out the young, younger of the evangelical, you would see a greater propensity for Senator Obama. Um, their strategy in going after him is pretty good, um, and he's got a good team, a dedicated team and a, and a, and a heartfelt team. I mean, they're looking, looking out after him and who he is. And... Um, you know, so that's new on the Democratic side. It's a new component to the campaign. Uh, I think it's a real one, uh, honest one. And, and so I applaud them on what they're doing. I think they're going to do well out there. Uh, Senator McCain's side, I, I don't know their strategy. strategy. Um, you know, my guess is, I'll, I'll throw something his way. My guess is, is that he'll surprise us at the Compassion Forum and around it we'll find a, a deeper faith than, than what, what pundits and talkers are assuming is there right now. But at the same time, I think that he's got a real challenge there and it's just about flip-flop this time um, in, in the dynamic there, but he's got a real challenge in, you know, moving beyond the very core of that traditional base and getting out into those who were, who, for, for those evangelicals who are looking at both as an option, I think McCain's the one with the challenge. We've been talking implicitly and explicitly about the evangelical vote, which is, of course, very important. Sure. But do you see other religious communities that are in play this time, Mark? Oh, sure. Uh, there are 50-plus million Catholics, um, yes. who, uh, you know, many of whom are uh, conservative on some social issues and, and more moderate or progressive or liberal on, on other issues. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge group, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Burnt Catholic Catholic. Catholic vote, um, understanding who they are. It's, um, you know, this this is a, a cycle that the economy is playing significantly strong in for obvious reasons. Folks out there are hurting and um, they need attention and you cannot dismiss the opportunity, again, to share your values, to, to, to use your values to place huge groups of working class Catholics together under an umbrella and then share the values you have on the economy to them and on strong families and, and, and how, you know, how you believe in creating jobs and stuff out there, it works. And um, I would argue that from a recent, you know, recent work I did out there where we took a, a economic message and took them into working class Catholic neighborhoods and we weren't talking faith, we weren't sharing testimony, we were just sharing the straight up Clinton message into those Catholic neighborhoods and, and um, I think we know how the exit polls performed or how we performed in exit polls with them and the evangelicals. Um, so you don't dismiss, you know, when you close your Bible and move on beyond that, you don't dismiss um, the work on values. I mean, our values carry through our lives and what we do, and there's a great place, a great way to, to frame and connect with voters. 
Well, we're almost out of time, gentlemen, but I can't resist asking you each the following question. What advice would you give to your party about going forward in November when it comes to, to reaching out to religious voters of one kind or another? Mark, what, what advice would you give Senator McCain? Two things. Be genuine and be respectful. Uh, be who you are. If, if you're not comfortable uh, talking about your faith, don't go try to talk about mm -hmm. your faith. And be respectful. I, I think um, all of us want a, a greater level of respect and civility and and um, you know I'd love to see campaign ads that did not mention the name of your opponent tell me why I should vote for you not why I shouldn't vote for this other guy so uh, those would be my two pieces of advice for anybody not just Senator yeah. McCain. Burns any advice for Senator Obama? You know very similar it's just um, keep it real as he's doing stay on that path and number two keep expanding that conversation keep growing it out there people want to talk to all their potential leaders keep expanding that conversation and having meeting and having that conversation with a growing segment of this community well on that note we'll have to wrap up our conversation thanks very much to Mark DeMoss and Bern Strider for being with us I'm John Green of the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life. Thank you for joining us.